Ali will also share a link in the chat. So uh, just a special shout out to our Comp Students Council team in which the success of these initiatives would not be possible. And that being said, welcome to our session on therapeutic medical physics and diagnostic imaging physics. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our invited speakers for the session, and we will introduce our invited panelists um, at the start of the panel session after the presentations. So please keep your questions um, for the group until the end. So I'm going to stop sharing so Dr. Robar can stop, uh, start sharing. And I will provide um, that introduction. So um, Dr. James, oh, lost the bio from the full screen. Awesome. So Dr. James Robar is the Chief of Medical Physics at Nova Scotia Health, uh, Professor of Radiation Oncology at Dalhousie University, and the founding director of the Master's Doctoral and Certificate Programs in Medical Physics at Dalhousie University. Uh, Dr. Robert divides his time between a leadership role at the NSH, uh, direct support of patient treatment experience in stereotactic radiotherapy and radiosurgery, and research and development with a focus on cutting edge technologies that improve the treatment of cancer patients. Uh, he is also the co-founder of Adaptive Medical Technologies, for which he became the Governor's General of Canada Innovation Award Laureate in 2021. Uh, Dr. Robar is also a champion of quality education and science, uh, and he serves uh, as the CAMPEP Graduate Program Review Committee and various board of directors, including the Society of Directors of Academic Medical Physics Programs and the Discover Center in Halifax. So welcome, Dr. Robar. Oh, you're on mute. Can you see my oh. slide okay? Thank you. Yeah, it looks great. Okay, and thanks for the invitation and, and to the Comp Students Council. Um, teaching students and residents and uh, giving them some advice is just about the favorite part of my, my career. <clears throat> and we're actually going to touch on that a little bit today. Um, I have a little bit of time to tell you about the journey and the destination, particularly of radiation oncology, medical physics. And Let's start here. So every year, COMP, of course, does a professional survey, and they ask the question, what subspecialty are you certified in? And as you can see here, about 80, well, 87.7% are in radiation oncology physics. So the vast majority of us in Canada, um, you can see how these numbers go by the other specializations. So we have about 7% in DI, down to 3% for MRI, 4% for nuclear medicine physics, for example. 6% um, reported more than one specialization. And I can tell you that, you know, I, and this is a little bit editorial, I think we need more certification in the other areas. For example, I've been looking at hiring uh, a nuclear medicine physicist lately, extremely hard to do. But anyway, the take home message is that the vast majority of us are in radiation oncology or radiation therapy of uh, physics. And this is, of course, also reflected by this, this uh, other question. Um, now looking at total numbers in the various specializations in Canada, you can see we have 489 in radiation oncology physics. Again, this is from the 2021 comp survey. Um, and down below, you can see the numbers who are actually certifying new members and certifying every year. So, you know, it's just it's hovering around a little bit under 20 every year in radonc physics. And have a look at the trickle of, of numbers of physicists being becoming certified in the other specializations. So those are the facts in terms of the demographics, at least um, according to the comp survey. And with that introduction, um, I'm going to take you through the, the uh, the exciting world of education, accreditation, and certification uh, with an emphasis on radiation oncology physics. Um, you know, I know that all of you are part way through the educational pathway right now, so you might know a few things about this that I don't know, but I'm going to lay down some of the facts here. Um, I was the vice president of CAMPEP for five years, um, and it's one of my favorite topics, so I'm going to put my CAMPEP hat on for a second. Um, CAMPEP uh, takes care of accreditation of both graduate and residency programs. Of course, the graduate programs would be master's or doctorate, 
Um, to enter these, you need a strong foundation in physics, as, as Campep states it, at minimum with a minor in physics, including upper level courses. So you could, for example, come from engineering physics as long as you have a minimum of a minor. And that could actually, you know, that requirement could be more stringent by program, but that's the minimum stated by CAMPEP. There are, of course, certificate programs. Um, this is really what has been become known as the alternate pathway. We'll talk about that in a second. This requires a PhD to enter one, as well as the undergrad physics requirements. Um, this cannot be done during a PhD. For example, you can't be doing a PhD in another um, specialization of physics and do a certificate program at the same time. I'd include six core topics typically. I'll, I'll list these in a moment. Um, very often, these are very compact program programs, like two terms. Uh, at Dalhousie University, where I am, it's the, it's the winter term, sorry, the fall term and the winter term and then it's done. Um, you all probably know very much about residency programs. Typically, these are two years. Sometimes they can be longer. In cases that they're longer, that is usually for one of two reasons. It's, it's because it includes a research component or the program director and the program has designed the program such that they expect incoming residents to require additional didactic education, so some of the coursework. Um, these can be in therapy, they can be in imaging, they can be in nuclear medicine. And a fine point, which not a lot of people know, is that if an institution is offering an imaging residency in DI, let's say, they can add on a nuclear medicine residency uh, with the addition of one year in the program or vice versa. And the other uh, the last one here is, is kind of a strange, uh, uh, more, more uh, exotic option, which is called professional doctorate in medical physics. So here's the pathway. Uh, you might be familiar with this. The traditional pathway is a graduate program um, culminating in an MSc or a PhD onto residency training, uh, certification, for example, with the CCPM or ABR, and then uh, entering the wonderful world of practicing as a clinical uh, radiation therapy physics here, physicist here. The alternate pathway was, was born out of the concept that maybe by having this traditional pathway, we're actually eliminating very talented people, let's say um, students who graduate with a PhD in another specialization of physics. And rather than sending them all the way back to the beginning, of this, this pathway, of this very long journey, um, they should be able to do a certificate program, which is just the didactic coursework, and then qualify for application to uh, residency training. Now, here's a lesser known pathway. Um, this is actually allowed by CAMPEP, and I thought I would call it out here. It is possible to graduate with a PhD from a non-CAMPEP accredited program um, and prove to a residency program director on admission or on review for admission that you actually meet the CAMPEP standards. And um, this is spelled out actually in the CAMPEP bylaws. Um, it, it is a lesser known route for sure, um, but it is allowed. So that is one pathway into residency training. The, the way this is stated actually in the CAMPEP bylaws is Applicants who have a PhD in physics or related discipline comply with undergrad physics coursework requirements as specified by in the CAMPEP standards and have other didactic preparation may be considered on an individual basis. So it adds a little bit of flexibility actually into this, these pathways. The other thing that, that I think is a little bit lesser known is um, the residency program can provide up to two remedial courses which may be taken during a two-year residency program. So for example, that might be for somebody coming into residency who hasn't done radiobiology yet or hasn't done radiation safety and protection yet. Um, the residency program actually is allowed to make that up, but only to the tune of two courses in two years. I mentioned core topics um, as per CAMPEP. Here they are. 
uh, these are six core topics. So radiological physics, radiation protection and safety, fundamentals of medical imaging, radiobiology, human anatomy and physiology, radiation therapy physics. Professional and ethics, professionalism and ethics can actually be um, delayed and postponed until the residency uh, program. So it's these six that um, are typically part of certificate programs, part of graduate programs, and would be reviewed by program directors on admission. Let's check out the number of programs uh, and, and the growth, or in one case, shrinkage, over approximately the last decade. So we have Canada, US, and when I say other, I mean other international programs. So in Canada, we have a disproportionate number of graduate programs, uh, 13, and it's grown by six over the past decade. Uh, 42 in the US, growth by 15. If we look at certificate programs, you can see in Canada, we have five. Um, that actually shrunk by one over the past decade. How about residency programs? We've got 15 in Canada, uh, big growth over the past decade, plus 12. And also huge growth in the US, 83 over the past decade. Um, you might be wondering where the international programs that are. There are graduate programs in uh, South Korea, in uh, Ireland, and in Australia. And I think the residency program, international residency program, is in Ireland. In terms of uh, residencies, types, and where, um, so 13 therapy residencies in Canada, two imaging, 92 therapy in the US, 32 imaging in the US, and one therapy uh, international. Okay, I alluded to a DMP. Um, I thought I'd put this in here because some people are curious about it. That is the combination of two years didactic education, so coursework immediately followed by two years of clinical training, typically no research involved, this is offered only at five institutions in the US. Um, it's a fairly recent concept. So the first one was accredited in 2015 and no further actually since 2018. So that seems to have leveled off. Um, one kind of funny aspect of this is students are paying sometimes quite dearly for these programs. Um, and I have seen instances, for example, where uh, DMP students during the clinical two years are sitting right beside residency um, or residents who are being paid. <laughs> so it's kind of a discontinuous, uh, a disconnect in programs, but it does exist. Uh, I thought I'd put something in about the match program. Uh, a lot of grad students, as they're preparing to graduate, ask me whether they should participate in the match. Um, this lays out the, the framework. Uh, a matching program was really born out of medical programs where an applicant registers in the program, usually in early December, handles all the application to programs themselves. The MP RAP system might be used to do this, submits a rank order list. So ranks favorite institutions by, I think it's about the third week of March, um, a magical algorithm matches the preference, preferences of institutions to preferences of applicants. And the result comes back fairly quickly by about the end of March, at least according to MedFiz Match. And program directors then send letters of confirmation by the end of April. The thing to be wary of, or aware of at least, is this match result constitutes a binding commitment from, in the words of the match program, from which neither the applicant nor the program can withdraw. So this is binding. Common question, especially from Canadian applicants, is that they notice <laughs> that there are many institutions, especially in Canada, that do not participate in the match. And, and so really, you know, they ask, what should I do? What, what is the consequence? What's the ramification of this? It's worth your time, I think, to read the rules um, on the MedFiz match page. Um, rules like, or answers to questions like, what should I do if I have an offer from a program that is not participating in the MedFiz match? 
Um, and the answer is you must decide prior to the rank order list deadline, that is submission of your rank ordered list, whether you want to accept the position from the non-match program or participate in the, in the MedFizz match. In other words, if you decide to accept a program that is, or, or a position that's outside of the match, you need to withdraw from the match program in time. And you can see there are some, uh, some apparent consequences of not doing this, for example, being reported to the AAPM and so on. So that's kind of a tricky situation to navigate. Um, very briefly, I'm just going to uh, address certification. I was so concerned about misquoting the rules of the Canadian College of Physicists in Medicine that I actually pasted it verbatim here. So applicants for membership shall possess a master's or doctoral degree from an accredited, accredited university or college in medical physics, physics, science with physics, and so on, uh, a, a minimum of two years full-time equivalent comprehensive patient-related experience. And that experience is normally acquired during the two-year residency program or bridging program, but cannot include work or studies uh, towards your, your grad degree, for example. I'll just call out another one here. And you know my part of this uh, C cubed seminar series is on radiation oncology physics. So D.2.6 is particular to radiation oncology physics. Applicants for certification in radiation oncology physics will be required to have successfully completed either a CAMPEP accredited residency program or a bridging program. Uh, you can look up the dates and you should look up the dates uh, if you're applying for uh, sitting the certification exam. Here they are for 2022. And just a few final slides on entering the workforce. And, and here I'm going to editorialize a little bit. I was asked to say something about the life, about life as a therapy physicist. Um, and you might be wondering, is it as great as I, as I think it is? Is it glamorous? What's it like? Well, uh, to answer that, I went straight to our position description for a medical physicist at Nova Scotia Health. And um, you can see the breakdown of all of our activities here. So the largest being support, direct support of patient treatment and research, but then divided between other things like education. So teaching grad students and residents, uh, selection and commissioning and deployment of new equipment commissioning and, and deployment of new techniques, radiation safety, QA. And you might be th thinking, wow, I, I won't spend more than 20% of my time on any single activity. The truth is, we're not all the same in a department, nor should we be in terms of our inclinations, our interests. Um, and these activities are rarely distributed uniformly among physicists. For example, in my department, some of our medical physicists spend up to about half their time on research and development, and others spend none. And, and really that is according to their uh, career goals and their talents and their skill sets. The other thing is things ebb and flow over time. So for example, major equipment like linear accelerators, imaging systems can be pretty rare and intermittent um, during this period you know, the equipment and, and commissioning part of this might skyrocket from 10% to about 50 to 60%. So um, don't, don't take the position description verbatim. Uh, just a note to say in Canada, we love our academics and about two thirds of us, according to the comp survey, hold an academic appointment. Uh, Claire asked me to say something about the day in the life. So here's a day in the life. Um, I don't always wake up at 6.30, but in this example, I do. Uh, eight o'clock, I'm working on some R&D project, maybe doing some coding, some interesting measurement or analysis. I have a long-term R&D project that I'm working on. But then at 10.17, my phone rings, and I run downstairs to the treatment wing, to the treatment unit or dosimetry, and solve a clinical problem, very hands-on, very sudden time sensitive, uh, recover with a good lunch, 
Uh, after that, hang out with my awesome graduate students, think about next generation technology, keep our eyes on the horizon, work on their, their research projects. Maybe some clinical work next, work on a stereotactic treatment plan for a patient. Uh, hopefully wrap this up with one of my friends who's a radiation oncologist, um, and then make time to just discuss with colleagues, hang out with colleagues. Very important to meet in the hallways, and of course, too rare during COVID. Uh, a bit of admin work, and, and because I'm chief of a department, this day kind of more reflects what my days used to be like before becoming a chief of a department, but most physicists have some amount of admin work that they do to keep things running. Uh, I talked to Wayne Beckham in Victoria about whether I could put up this uh, plot of, of salaries. Uh, in the end, he said yes. So this is from the comp survey. And um, really the, the take home message here, I hope is we're almost within each other's error bars from province to province. The last column here is the US where you can see that the median is about 50K higher and the outliers are, are um, far higher or almost as low as, as Canada. So quite a range in the US. Um, anyway, a lot of students wanna ask that question but they're too polite and shy to do so. So I thought I'd include it here. So just last couple of slides here. I always ask my students, grad students, how do you visualize your career? I mean, if you could look forward a, ahead a few years, how do you visualize it? And almost all of them say, I really want to have this combination of clinical work, research, and teaching. Um, how can they keep those doors open? Well, with a PhD, a residency, and clinical certification. Those would keep all the doors open. Final note, when it comes to look at looking at positions, um, I would just caution you to make sure that the job is at, as advertised. So don't hesitate to have real conversations with physicists in the prospective department. Uh, a note about um, the ability to do research and development as part of a position that combines these areas. Um, search the literature, uh, look for presentations from that institution and, and that department, really check whether the department is producing output, uh, learn about grantsmanship and track record in, in terms of landing grants in the department. And finally, ask someone like me, the chief of medical physics, some really pointed questions like, how do you mandate and track research productivity in your department? And look for a good answer to that question. You know, if, if I were to answer that uh, with something like, well, you know, if my physicists have a bit of time, I, I allow them to do research. Um, that wouldn't be a very compelling answer, I don't think. So keep your, keep your sights very high um, and remember that you're putting a lot of investment in your education and you should land the position that, that you intend to, to land. Final three thoughts. This flowchart, you're, you're somewhere in the middle of this flowchart that I showed earlier. And I know because I remember graduate school and I remember certainly residency and it seems arduous and long, but it's well worthwhile um, considering that you may actually work for about 30 years afterwards. Second point is the profession of medical physics and radiation therapy physics is something that you can actually tailor. And so, um, with some, some careful planning and some good choices, this balance between clinical research and academics can be recalibrated. You can tune it, actually, and you can adjust that as, as time goes by and maybe your priorities change. And finally, you know, I thought before I started working that there were a lot of scientists in hospitals, that everyone might be a scientist. Um, it's not true. You're, it, it's actually quite rare to have somebody who is trained as a scientist, but working at the front lines of healthcare. And that puts you in a very privileged uh, position to affect change and, and actually um, have a positive in, impact on diagnosis and treatment. So with that, I'll just um, leave my door open to you later if you wanna 
send me any emails or if you have any questions at any time. And thanks very much again for the invitation. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Omar, so much. That, that was a very informative presentation about the process to um, essentially become a medical physicist. Um, for the purpose of time, please save your questions until the end. And during that time, um, Amir, I will introduce you. Feel free to share your screen. So Amir Johnson um, is a diagnostic imaging physicist at Kaiser Permanente in the Northern California region. She received her Bachelor of Science in Physics from Xavier University of Louisiana, Master's of Science in Medical Physics at Georgia Institute of Technology and completed a residency at West Physics Consulting in Atlanta. She's a member of several AAPM groups, including the Imaging Practice Accreditation Committee, Professional Mentorship Working Group, and the Diversity Inclusion Subcommittee. She is also a breast cancer survivor and an advocate for healthcare equity. So please feel free to begin. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Good. I had some issues with audio earlier, so I just wanted to make sure. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Robar. I enjoyed your presentation too. I don't pay attention to therapy physics as much as I used to, so it's nice to kind of get an update. Um, I'll just get right to, uh, get right into it so that we have time for all of your questions at the end. Here we go. All right. So diagnostic imaging medical physics. Um, you, I'm sorry, I am, uh, needing to move all of these things from screen so I can see what I wrote. All right. Imaging physics, um, imaging physicists are doing research, um, to develop and improve imaging techniques to better diagnose the disease and identify response to treatment, generally speaking. And that can look like um, anything from the clinic all the way to academic spaces. Um, we're also evaluating associated computer systems, algorithms and data, and developing new imaging algorithms and procedures. <laughs> Um, I will briefly gloss over this because the pathway is very similar to um, therapy physics, but if you're looking to get into image uh, industry, uh, master's or PhD um, is necessary. Academic research, you're going to need a PhD. Um, and if you're looking at clinical, re uh, clinical um, imaging physics, a master's or a PhD and a residency. Um, there are currently 34 camp accredited residency programs for imaging. 22 of them are diagnostic only. 12 of them are combined diagnostic and nuclear medicine, and we have two in Canada right now. Well, this is just a map of where those imaging physics residencies are. A lot of them are on the east side of the United States, but in Canada, um, we're on the west side. So board certification for imaging, <clears throat> there are several different pathways. You've got CCPM, ABR, um, ABSNM, <clears throat> CHP, and ABMP. Um, in the clinic and in consulting, the, I work with people who have one or more of these um, certifications all the time. Uh, I know ABR is super popular and um, probably the most um, common certification we see in the United States, but um, 
lots of um, different clinical positions can use all of these certifications as well. So if you're looking for, um, if you're looking to work in the clinic, which is what my presentation is uh, focused on, um, you should also be considering um, these other certification processes as well. Um, practice environments for imaging physics, um, academic centers, private or community hospitals, government hospitals, and then medical physics service groups. Um, your day-to-day -day activities in each of these different um, practice environments are going to look quite different. I personally have worked in um, community hospitals, and I've worked in medical physics service groups. Um, or a consulting group. And so I'll talk from my experience in those environments. My day-to-day -day clinical activities, um, a lot of time is spent doing equipment performance evaluation that might be acceptance testing or um, annual testing for all of our modalities, radiography, fluoroscopy, that expect CT, MRI, mammography, and the amount of time you're spending on those is often um, dictated by what regulations cover them. Um, we spend a lot of time establishing, or I spend a lot of time establishing and maintaining QA programs for imaging equipment. I work for Kaiser Permanente in Northern California. Um, we have 24 medical centers. And um, we have four imaging physicists on staff. And so um, some of my work um, in is establishing and maintaining a QA program that other members of our team carry out. So that might be technologists, um, our x-ray engineers. Um, we also have some outside consulting physicists that um, work with us as well. So a lot of my time is spent training folks to carry out those procedures, um, making sure that their um, reports are okay, um, making sure that everybody knows what we're doing. And unfortunately, and I've been complaining about this actually lately, um, when we have turnover or during a time like right now when uh, we're in a pandemic, some of these QA procedures, um, people forget how to do them or people forget the importance of doing them. Um, and so I've actually spent quite a bit of time um, just maintaining these QA programs for our imaging equipment lately. Spent some time doing proto protocol optimization, patient dose calculations, shielding design and surveys, data analysis, um, setting policies and procedures, interpreting um, regulatory and accreditation requirements, and figuring out how to implement them. Um, we spend time in radiation and MRI safety committees and other safety committees. Um, spend a lot of time training physicians, technologists, engineers, managers, um, other folks who are a part of the radiology team and um, spend some time doing risk and compliance activities. Um, and I didn't, um, I thought about figuring out what the percentage of my job um, I spend on each of these, but it really varies day to day. It varies year to year, depending on what's going on um, in the practice environment. Um, it can vary depending on um, what's going on um, in the industry. And so, like Dr. Robar said, you want to, if you're looking at a job description, um, those percentages can definitely, should definitely be considered to be on a sliding scale because your job's going to change depending on what um, clinical needs are. Um, clinical research, um, most of the research that is done in a clinical environment when you're looking at a community hospital or um, 
um, or medical physics practice group is going to be on investigating or implementation of new products or processes in the clinic. Those are all centered around patient efficacy, patient safety, and staff safety. Um, so oftentimes it'll be a physician who's been approached by a vendor, hey, we've got a new product that can make your life easier, and they'll call one of the physicists, hey, this vendor says that they can make my life easier with this new product, what do you think? Um, and so we might figure out how we would test that or figure out how, uh, whether we want to implement something like that in our clinic, and um, if we do, how we'd go about doing it. Um, other things that have come up during the pandemic, for example, when um, personal protective equipment was scarce, um, projects come up with, hey, we need to isolate patients away from other patients and staff. How can we still safely image them without using up all of our protective equipment and exposing staff um, while, while keeping our patients and our staff safe? So those are the kinds of research projects that come up when you're in a community hospital or um, medical physics practice group. Other duties, um, administrative scheduling time in the clinic. I wrote this down because I did not know that I would spend so much time, so much of my time um, figuring out when I would get in the clinic or being kicked off of a machine um, because patient access is um, always extremely important. So if I need to take a machine down for four hours, nobody likes that. Um, producing reports for regulators, for imaging directors, um, for engineers, um, general hospital training, infection control, security, things like that. Um, business duties, um, this is one thing that, these are things that I didn't realize I would spend a lot of time on selling ideas to various stakeholders if we're going to implement a new policy. For example, in my um, my organization, we recently rolled out um, policy to discontinue um, fetal and gonadal shielding during radiography. And um, I spent a lot of time convincing everybody that we should do this, why we should do this, reassuring folks um, that it was going to be okay when we do this. And yeah, I felt like a politician going around for the last maybe year or two, even um, selling this policy to all the different stakeholders in our organization. Um, one last Unexpected aspect of clinical imaging physics for me is how heavy decision making power can be extremely rewarding, but also extremely exhausting. Um, and I, when I was going through school and training, I thought, oh, therapy physicists, um, you know, have an emotionally heavy um, job, but I was thinking imaging physicists would not. Um, but I have since learned that we do. <laughs> it's still, um, like Dr. Lobar said, there aren't very many scientists who are working um, in healthcare. So um, the people around us view us as experts and they trust us. And um, when they ask questions, um, oftentimes I'll be asked a question and I'm just, or I used to think, you know, oh, I'm having a conversation with a colleague. I wasn't you know, re realizing the gravity of that. And then next week I see a policy, policy change in the clinic. We've changed, you know, policy and procedure and the workflow based off of, you know, what I thought was a small conversation <laughs> with, with a colleague. Um, and so subsequent to, you know, me experiencing that, I had to like take a step back and go, oh, wait a minute, the conversations I have, um, the weight of my title and my knowledge and experience is taken very seriously here. Um, and that can be 
that can be emotionally exhausting to make sure everything you are ever saying um, is going to be um, feasible for and reasonable for um, for everybody in the organization, most importantly patients. So uh, that said, I will give the floor back to Claire so that we can open up for questions. Hey, thank you so much, Mia. That was a great overview of imaging physics. I think uh, we don't often get to hear about it uh, by virtue of it being a smaller field, but it's great to hear your perspective. Uh, so now we'll move on to the panel portion of the session. Uh, if any of our audience members has any questions for the panelists, either from the presentations or in general, please feel free to write them in the chat and we'll ask. Uh, in the meantime, I'd like to invite our panelists to join us and introduce themselves. Uh, so maybe we can start with Dr. Sheikh. Hi, I'm Khadija Sheikh. Um, I'm a proton physicist at Johns Hopkins. Um, I also serve as the associate program director for our residency. Um, I completed my PhD at Western um, and I'm originally from Canada. I'm happy to join today. Uh, and then Dr. Burton. Yes, uh, so my name is Christiane Burton. Um, I'm a diagnostic medical physicist at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Um, I also did my PhD at Western uh, during the time when uh, Khadija was there um, and in diagnostic, or sorry, in medical physics. Um, and then I did my residency in diagnostic uh, medical physics at uh, Boston Children's and Harvard Med. Great. Uh, and finally, Dr. Omotoyo. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I completed my uh, degrees at uh, University of Winnipeg, my undergrad, and then my master's uh, at Carleton University in Ottawa, and then my PhD uh, not too far ago uh, at the University of Manitoba in medical physics, uh, Camp Ebb. So I am uh, an imaging physicist, specifically in nuclear medicine. And I also uh, spend my, some of my time uh, doing some health physics support as well. So that's, uh, I guess, uh, two roles combining one. So that's it. Hey, welcome. Uh, so we already have some questions coming in for, from the audience. So we'll get right into it. Uh, so our first question is from Josephine who asked why are majority of medical physicists specialized in therapy versus other specialties like diagnostic or nuclear medicine? Is it due to differences in clinical need or competition? Um, maybe we can ask one of the panelists who just joined us to chime in there. Dr. Omotoyo, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I believe uh, the easiest answer that I can give to that is because most of the jobs there are available in medical physics are mostly therapy physics. And for that reason, most people in the program would tend to want to be employable. So they would uh, tend to at least tell their training uh, to therapy physics. Uh, so I believe that would be the easiest uh, answer for that. Most of the residency programs as well are in therapy physics. So, so that also, I guess, uh, directly correlates to the uh, availability of jobs. So, so that's the major reason. And uh, uh, if you don't want to be able to find jobs easily, you might decide to go to imaging physics, for example. But I decided that uh, that might be my part. So that's how I got in. How I got there. I guess we can discuss later. But yeah. So the easiest answer is that's where the most jobs are, as you can see from. The uh, presentation from Dr. Robert, like 88% of the qualified medical physicists, or at least CCPMP members, are uh, RT physicists. Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Burton. I'll just add to that. I, I, he's correct. So there are more jobs in the therapy uh, section than there are in the imaging and, and definitely in the nuclear medicine. Um, I remember when I was applying for uh, residency uh, positions. And it was a common misconception that imaging physicists, you know, wouldn't, be, wouldn't do all that much. Um, one comment I had, and this is before I got into um, the residency program, 
is that diagnostic medical physicists basically just play around with like mammo tubes all day. Um, and that's not the case. Um, I think that you can go, you can be more clinical if you want to, and um, you can do more research if you want to, or you can do both. And so that's just something to, to keep in mind. Originally, I didn't want to, I, I wasn't planning to go down the imaging route, but I got, um, you know, I, I matched with a, a, a residency program and I ended up thinking that imaging may have been a, a better choice for me um, in the end. And, and it was, but uh, yeah, the, he, he's correct in saying that there are more jobs and I, but I just think that there's a misconception um, of what uh, diagnostic medical physicists do and what nuclear uh, medicine physicists do. Cause I also do nu nuke med stuff and that requires a lot of attention. Awesome, thanks so much. I see that Laszlo from the audience um, has a question. So feel free to unmute and ask. Right. Hi guys, I'm Laszlo. Great talks. Um, I just want to ask a quick question. So some of you, and you also mentioned that some people you work with have more than one uh, certification. And from the presentations, it seems that you need to do residency to get a given certification, right? So how do you obtain multiple certifications? Like, do you start working and then in the meantime, at the same time, somehow you do another residency, another specialty, or how does that work? I'll let someone else go first if there's no other comments. Yeah, yeah I'll, let, I'll let Dr. Jensen go for that. I, that was in my presentation. I'll say some, uh, quickly, not every certification requires a residency. Um, so ABR requires residency and I, CCPM requires res residency. ABSNM, CHP, um, ABMP do not require residency. They do requ they do have requirements, um, education requirements and experience requirements, but it's not um, specifically a residency. Um, also, if you have one certification, um, you don't, and you want to seek another one, you don't necessarily have to go back and uh, for do a full residency. You can get credit. Um, for a portion of the didactic or the, um, di yeah, the didactic and clinical training from your first certification. And, um, and I know ABR was changing recently. So, or, or since I last paid attention, ABR, like going from like adding a uh, diagnostic um, or a nuclear medicine residency on top of, you know, if you have one of the other. So I don't know the exact requirements on that right now. But for example, um, ABSNM, if you have an ABR residency already, then you do get credit, I think, for the first um, exam. And then so you only have to take the second exam. So the requirements are kind of different for each one. I we all, I Because we had such a short time, I didn't want to like list out all of the details, but you should definitely, um, you can definitely check those out on the respective websites. Great, thanks. Let's get to that. <laughs> uh, did anybody have anything else to comment on that? Okay. Yeah, she's correct. Actually, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, she she's right that um, ABR has changed their requirements. Um, so if you do like a diagnostic medical physics um, re residency, and then you want to add on the nuclear medicine residency, then you can do the ABR. Um, for both diagnostic and nuclear medicine, but they've changed it so that if you, um, you used to be able to, to, to do like 36 hours or something like that um, on the job um, in nuclear medicine, and then you could, you could apply to do the ABR uh, part two and part three for nuclear medicine, um, but that has changed, but you can still do that for ABS and M. Uh, so that, that's uh, another route that um, uh, diagnostic medical physicists have taken. Um, just as an FYI, just because I I know a few who have gone down that route, e even though they've done um, a residency in uh, in nuclear medicine, it's just because I think the exams are a little bit more straightforward than the ABR ones. And Laszlo, I'll just point out uh, in terms of the CCPM, that requirement for CAMPEP accredited residency was particular to ra the radiation oncology physics specialization, so. Um, for example, I could be certified as a, as a radiation oncology physicist um, 
and somewhere through the course of my clinical work, acquire, let's say, two years of imaging patient-related expertise. There's no actual requirement for residency for the imaging specialization with the CCPM. So then I could probably apply to, to sit um, for that certification exam. Yeah, I was going to add that because myself, I'm not certified yet. So I was going to be because I did not complete a residency program. I guess I'm probably the only one out of the panelists that didn't do that. So I will be due to apply, uh, I think, in the next couple of months to be able to take the exam. But that's just due to being uh, working and, uh, in the field, but not because I completed a residency. That only applies to, I guess, the imaging part. It doesn't apply to radiation oncology. So that's one thing to keep in mind. You don't have to do a residency to be certified in Canada as a, a diagnostic physicist. Awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Laszlo. Um, so our next question is directed to Dr. Sheikh. It's about prote proton therapy. Uh, it's from Hussein. He asks, if an applicant's PhD is not in proton therapy, would they be at a disadvantaged position for a residency program that offers proton therapy? Um, so I would have to say, no, you're not disadvantaged. I mean, my PhD was in pulmonary MRI, so it was very imaging focused. And then I transitioned to um, a radiation therapy residency. And the residency's job is to train you. And um, our program offered a three month proton therapy rotation. And that's kind of what led me to love that field. And that's why I work as a proton therapy physicist. So I wouldn't say you're disadvantaged at all if your PhD doesn't focus on proton therapy. Awesome, thanks so much. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling through the chat because there's a lot of questions here. Um, so there's a general one by Sam. Um, is there a right moment to choose a specialty? Um, is there a point where your background experiences limit the available choices? So let's say my grad experience is radonc oriented, would I be less likely to get selected as an imaging medical physicist? That's a really good question. <laughs> Feel free to answer. That's a good question. I've seen, and now I've seen, um, you know, candidates come out of uh, imaging programs and then they get accepted to therapy, but I, I actually haven't seen the reverse. And I'm not saying that it's going to disadvantage you. It hasn't, I haven't seen it disadvantage anyone, you know, um, going from imaging to therapy. Um, now, this is what happened to me. Um, when I was applying for residency programs, somewhere along the way, uh, University of Michigan, um, when I applied there, they told me that, and I had applied to their therapy program, they said that I should stick with imaging because my background is in imaging, but they, that's not the case for everyone. So some people will, will come in with an imaging background and they'll get a, a therapy position um, if, if they're a good fit for the program. So um, it shouldn't disadvantage you. I'm just um, speaking from experience. I've only seen imaging uh, people with imaging backgrounds accepted to therapy, but not vice versa. But don't quote me on that. It might not, it may, it, it shouldn't disadvantage you, um, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, and if anyone else has seen that, that would, that would be great. Uh, just to, even for my own knowledge. Just look. Awesome, thanks. Um, I have another one in the chat. Um, do you believe that the number of imaging residency programs in Canada is a realistic representation of the imaging physics positions in the Canadian job market? So Aziz, probably a good one. <laughs> I would say yes. Uh, there's not a lot of imaging physics positions, like specifically imaging physics positions. So I would say the availability pretty much correlates to the availability of the job. So. Yeah, so if you strictly want to be an imaging physicist, then it will probably be more challenging to, to find a position where you would be hired easily. And obviously, because it's not that many residency positions to be properly trained as well. Like I said, uh, I, haven't com I did not complete the residency. Uh, so I was lucky to be able to just uh, fall into my position due to the fact that there was a position opening and it wasn't nuclear medicine physics position, again, where you don't require a residency to be able to do the job. Uh, so I pretty much have to learn everything 
on the job, which is not the way uh, most of people get hired in medical physics. They want you to do a residency program because that's where they can structure your program and make sure you're fully training all, at least familiar with all uh, uh, the areas that you're going to be working with. So, so yeah, so I would say the residency availability is pretty much uh, a factor of the fact, a factor of the availability of jobs in Canada for imaging positions. Unless someone has, unless someone disagrees. Yeah, Dr. Robar, I think you had your hand up for a second that I completely missed. Did you have anything to add to this or the last comment? That was for the previous question. Do you still want me to add to it? Okay, thanks. So, um, And, and they've been, so far, they've been successful 100% of the time. So it's a little anecdotal, but um, uh, that's kind of like an unofficial pathway, maybe. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that insight. Ali, do you have a question? There's a lot of questions. Feel free to answer the, the questions in the chat as well. Um, if, if there's anything particular that you want to add. So go ahead, Ali. Yeah, yeah so uh, this next question is from Monique. Uh, they ask, I'm currently doing my master's in medical physics in a non -campus. Ali, you're cutting out a bit. That's oh, okay, I can read the question from sure. Monique. Your uh, internet stabilizes. So Yannick asks, I'm currently doing my MSc in medical physics, which is non-CAMPEP. I have experience in Monte Carlo, health physics, and various other backgrounds. I'm wondering what professional options are there for me, or would it be best if I completed a PhD? It's a good question. Uh, I can answer a little bit of that. Uh, yeah. Sorry, 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 Amir. Uh, I just wanted to jump in because uh, my master's was also in medical physics, but uh, it was non camp uh, just because of the way it was at Caltech University. So I tried to uh, see if it could work uh, uh, professionally with that. And uh, to get into a residency program, uh, obviously you need either a master's or uh, a PhD at the time, but uh, I struggled to be able to find uh, anyone to accept uh, uh, my master's, most likely because it was non campus So I ended up having to uh, just sort of, I just decided to go for my PhD just to, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to wait too long. But why, before I did that, I was able to get research associate positions uh, uh, to obviously gain more uh, experience. And uh, um, because I also enjoyed doing some research. So that was how. Uh, what led me uh, to getting into a PhD program. So I would say, at least in Canada, uh, you could, if you're lucky, if you're exceptional, but uh, your chances are slim. That would, I would just be honest. So you have to have a CAMPEP master's or at least a PhD CAMPEP even, or if you don't have a CAMPEP PhD, you can do a certificate program to get uh, a residence position. That's just in Canada. In the US, it's another story. I don't know too much. I'll let uh, Hamir speak about the U.S. Yeah. I can add. I'd say the. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Christian. No, nope. go ahead. No, no, I was. I, I, I did. I missed that. If you want to go first, that's fine. I was just going to add that um, that campus degree is is more highly desired in the U.S. as well. So. Um, you, um, if you can get into a campus um, accredited PhD program, um, that's probably a good idea. If you're looking to, um, if you're looking to do clinical work, at least. If you're looking to go into industry, then um, residency is not as important. Um, if you're 
and I I don't know about research positions, honestly. I just that's, that's my um, that's not my area. But yeah, same thing for US. Um, a camp at a accredited degree is is going to be important. Awesome, thanks, uh, Dr. Robert. Feel free to chime in. Uh Amir, I'm glad you mentioned industry there, and that's why I had my hand up. We haven't really <laughs> talked about that very much today. Um, a little perspective on that. So I co-founded a high-tech company in, in the radiation oncology sector, and um, it's hard for, we've doubled in size or so in the past year. It's hard for us to hire um, medical physicists. Why? Because most of them are following those pathways <laughs> that I showed on my slide, right? But it's fascinating work. Um, it, it does involve medical physics. It involves science and R&D and cool stuff like that. And so one of the answers to that question that was posed, yeah, PhD, but I think only if you're inclined towards research, if you love research, if, if you have the appetite for about four years of PhD life, um, but another avenue is, is uh, industry, and um, I think you'd be highly competitive to, to apply for some pretty cool positions in industry. Awesome. Thank you for all those insights. So there's a question for the therapy physicists. So uh, Dr. Sheik and Dr. Robar, if you could chime in. Um, it's about uh, what kind of patient interaction do you get um, as a therapy physicist? So interesting question. So our clinic is divided in an interesting way where we have a different physicist doing different tasks daily. So we have um, a simulation physicist, an on-call physicist, a treatment planning physicist, and a plan check physicist. So in that, the most patient interaction that I have is actually during the simulation. So when the patient comes in for their first appointment um, and we're prepping them to have um, a CT scan, with the treatment plan. Um, and oftentimes we will interact with the patient. Um, and that's on the proton side. I can't really comment on the photon side anymore, but um, maybe Dr. Rothar can say something like, oh, something about that. Sure. So the clinical physicists who have the most patient contact, <clears throat> two groups, those involved in brachytherapy, because brachy, for example, HDR brachytherapy is a live treatment planning process. Uh, you're in the OR, you're in scrubs. Uh, you're working on things. It's very dynamic. It happens in real time. And a lot of our physicists love that. Some don't. Um, the second group is those involved in stereotactic radiosurgery, which, you know, according to guidance documents, has the medical, the planning medical physicists attending the treatment in critical cases with, with very high dose per fraction. And um, I certainly began my career like lowering the cranium of a patient into an immobilization system and then like attaching tertiary collimators and you know I've been thrown up on several times and you know real contact you know um, it depends on what your specialization is however uh, I've just been um, through some training courses on adaptive radiation therapy where you're actually replanning uh, a patient every fraction of treatment I think that's going to bring physicists back to the treatment unit a lot more than they have been before because of all the critical decisions that have to be made in that in that process. So that's going to be really interesting for radiation therapy physicists. Great. So uh, we have a question here about how do you actually decide between imaging and therapy? So what was your thought process when you know, you were like the audience going through your training programs and you had to make some career decisions. I'm not sure if any, if anyone in particular has a question there. I mean, an answer, sorry. Yes, Dr. Robar. I'll, I'll, I'll back it. I, I just spoke, so somebody else can go first, maybe. Yeah, go ahead, Amir. I, I'm gonna come up with a really um, non-academic answer. When I was going through my training program, I was, um, I already had small kids and I had a family and I was very much thinking about what is the day-to-day -day life going to look like and how is that going to be integrated into my family? Um, 
And so I looked at how for in, in imaging physics, for example, when you're a consultant, I think someone else in the chat had a question about remote um, facilities, the need for imaging physicists. Most most facilities, most clinics with a any imaging equipment need an image need some imaging physics services. Um, how much of that do they need a full FTE? Probably not. So what you have is a lot of medical physics service groups who provide consulting services. And when I was a consultant, for example, um, I might have 12 different small hospitals that I worked with um, at any given moment. And I'm traveling to each of those sites. So spending the night in hotels um, for several days in a row, um, those kinds of things um, impacted my decision. So for me, I was looking for, hey, if I live in a big city with larger hospitals, I won't have to travel to super remote areas. Now that I'm a little, um, like my kids are old now, I might, I have less of a need to, you know, be hands-on at home every day. I like it in the next phase of my career, I might consider um, going to a, some kind of practice where I needed to travel more. Um, so for me, it was in, in imaging physics, anybody who goes into imaging physics, that's going to be a consideration because there's a lot of travel if you're working with a consulting group. Um, In-house physics um, positions, are there aren't that many of them. You only have them at very large um, hospital systems and people stay in those positions forever. They never retire because <laughs> they're great. Um, so those are kind of those are logistical considerations that I made um, when choosing. Uh, awesome. Does anyone have anything to add to that? I, I could add a little story. Um, I began my grad work in nuclear medicine physics. So I was I was building PET detectors, high resolution PET detectors, you know, segmenting bismuth germinate crystals on a saw during my master's. And, and I thought, and, and the science was fascinating, right? It was, the imaging science was great. I loved it. Then it came time to, for me to think about that PhD versus job question. I found out that, you know, the likely place I was going to work was Knoxville, Tennessee, because PET wasn't that clinical yet, wasn't too widespread. And that's where they were making PET detectors. So my answer is along the same vein as Amir's in that I kind of got pragmatic at, at some point. And I thought, in the future, I'm going to want to choose where I live. You know, I'm, I'm going to want that flexibility. And um, I switched. I switched at that point from master's to PhD to radiation oncology physics. So I think there was like some prag pragmatism that kicked in at that point. But this is also just a little bit of a plug for switching fields between your master's and your PhD. Because it turns out that that imaging preparation became really useful later. Uh, as, as I became a medical physicist and luck would have it that imaging and therapy would merge with image guidance, so. Awesome, Dr. Byrne, do you wanna add a bit to that? I was gonna say that Amir is right. Like when you get an in-house diagnostic medical physics position, you just don't wanna leave it. Um, and I had an option of doing consulting work with a group in New Jersey, which I really, I, I like the team and everything, but it's a lot of traveling. And then I got a position at St. Jude and I was like, yes, finally, like this is my, you know, as I was going through, I, I think imaging chose me to be honest, because I tried to get into therapy, but I think in the end, it, it just made more sense for me to go into imaging. Um, and so when I started going down this route, I said, okay, I, I want to be an, an, an in-house imaging physicist because I don't want to travel everywhere. I, I like actually being at the hospital and I like doing research. And, you know, if you have your PhD, then you, you're able to, um, you, you do your clinical work. And then instead of sitting there, like twiddling your thumbs, you can do a lot of research on the side. So that's what I, that's what I wanted to do. And I think, um, um, you know, I, I kind of just fell into it, but in the end it, it worked out. Um, but it was, it was very frustrating at first. Um, you know, when, especially when you have to make that choice, because yeah, it's, you know, if you, people say one they, they want to go down the imaging route because it is enjoyable they and they look at it initially and they say yeah that, that'd be great 
there's like, there's not that many jobs. So I'm going to go down the therapy route. And I understand that completely. Cause that's what my thinking was like, I was like, I better get a therapy position because there's just more jobs out there. Um, but as you, as you keep going along, you, you realize that, you know, yes, there are fewer positions in imaging, but fewer people apply to them. So, you know, there is still a chance to get these positions, but yeah, if you get an imaging, like physics position in a hospital, um, like I'm the only one I, it's, I don't want to leave this position. So yeah, just to confirm what she's saying. <laughs> All right, awesome. I think we have time for just a couple more questions, but I guess this is a general one from Sam. So what is clinical like when you work or when you have multiple specialties? Are you working in multiple departments at the same time or does it simply give you more opportunities? I can answer that, but I don't wanna, I just spoke. So if anyone else wants to go first, uh, feel free. Um, so I did my uh, uh, residency in diagnostic imaging, and I did have a rotation in nuclear medicine. Um, now, luckily, I have a small department, so there's not that many modalities here. So I, you know, I do nuclear medicine and and diagnostic imaging, but it's all under diagnostic imaging. That's not always the case. I also work with radiation safety. Um, I sort of act as like a radiation safety officer within my own department. Um, again, not always the case. Sometimes you, you know, sometimes the medical physicist will get hired and also be the radiation safety officer. I'm not trained as one. So I'm just as an acting one. And there's, I just do whatever overlaps well with their position with what I'm supposed to be doing. Um, so I don't know if I'm answering this question. Sorry. What was the question again? Uh, answering the question. Um, I lost it in the chat. I think it says something about specialization. So I took that as you have to have like, uh, have a imaging, imaging specialization and therapy specialization, which oh, many yeah. people don't have. So right. you can be trained in it and you can be experienced in it, but many people don't usually have the different specializations at the same time. I don't know if Dr. Uh, Robert has the, say, uh, the two different specializations because he's also an imaging physicist. So, but I guess he didn't bother to <laughs> to get to yeah. get it yeah the therapy I didn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah so not many people have this uh, the same special like two different specializations but in the u.s i'm sure there are a lot of them but not that many in canada i think yeah in the u.s like you can have uh, diagnostic imaging and nuclear medicine but i haven't seen imaging and therapy yet uh, i'm not saying that you can't do it i just haven't seen it yet yeah yeah, I think it used to be more common, but as duties increase for each specialty and as we specialize more, it kind of split off. So um, imaging and nuclear definitely um, often you, you might do both and you might imaging and health physics as well, but um, not, not anymore. People aren't doing both therapy and imaging anymore. And then um, I also wanted to say, I feel like some, even within imaging or nuclear, some, in some places you might specialize on a particular modality. You might have a CT physicist, and you might have an MRI physicist. And then in other places, you might be doing every modality. Um, and so in those places where you're, where you're a specific, specifically an MRI physicist, you're gonna go a lot deeper into that. And, I found I'm, my my current position. I, I specialize not in MRI, uh, but I, we 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 split duties by modality, and I find myself like thinking, oh no, I'm losing my skills in the other modality. Should I <laughs> should I think about that? But um, but that's you know kind of the career choices you make as you go. And to add to that, that's yeah. where a residency program comes in. A residency program I have. Uh, uh, rotations in all the imaging modalities. So you could be trained in CT, mammography, and you can be trained in uh, nuclear medicine as well and, and all that. So that way you can, I guess, uh, gain more experience in, uh, in all the modalities. But in some centers, like it's, like Amir says, uh, it's separated. So I only do nuclear medicine over here. So I don't do uh, the CT, X-ray and mammography, uh, for example. So so it depends, that's where the residency also comes in. Uh, so you have to be careful on how you choose your imaging residency, if that's uh, what you wanna, uh, the, the path you wanna go in. So, yeah. 
so and I can't I, I also do some health physics work as well so so that uh that's why you know there's a lot of uh flexibility in defining uh, uh what you want to do uh, depending on where you work oh go ahead dr Roden, if you want to add one more thing me yeah um so I, I was told after i did my residency program to choose um to go somewhere where you could work on every single modality possible so at a children's hospital, you'll likely do every modality except for mammography, um, unless they don't have a nuclear medicine program, um, which we do, so we're lucky. But that was um, advice that was given to me um, by um, uh, one of my mentors at Boston Children's Hospital. Because at Boston Children's Hospital, you have one physicist who does CT, and you've got one who does X-ray, one who does mammography, and uh, one who does MR. So I didn't want to you know, box myself in. Um, and so the advice that was given to me after I, you know, when I was applying for jobs is just choose something where you can practice on all the modalities. Cause you only have two years for a residency program or two or three years, but you know, it's, you do two month rotations and it's probably realistically may not be enough time for you to understand everything about that modality and, and understand everything that can go wrong, um, and have that, that experience. So um, to come out of a residency program and then have a job where you can work on all modalities is a, it was one of the, it was just good advice that was given to me. Awesome. Thanks so much. We are almost out of time. Um, there is one more question. I think that would be really good to wrap it up. Um, so the question is, is what is the most exciting thing that you uh, find as a therapy or an imaging physicist? Um, like, is there a treatment system or treatment or a imaging modality that uh, really makes you excited about your job every day? So I think that'll be a good one to end off um, each of the speakers. Uh, Khadija, do you want to start with Dr. Sheik? Sure. Um, for me, I don't think it's like a modality that I like so much. I mean, I only work with protons, but my favorite part is probably when I'm a simulation physicist and I get to interact with the patients. Honestly, that's the most meaningful part of my job. Awesome. Thanks so much. Uh, Amir? Um, similar to Khadija's answer, I think... Um, just pure science, MRI and molecular imaging is super exciting because of the growth potential, like the potential for applications are just so wide open. So that's always exciting. Um, but also for me, like small things that really make a difference for patients. And I, I'm a breast cancer survivor. So once I had that experience of being a patient, I realized how important those little things are. Um, so even something like um, explaining to a technology, like I had a technologist come up to me recently and say, hey, I don't know why we're doing this. And I, I can't, I can't do this to our, with our patients, um, because I don't believe in it. And I feel like we're harming patients. And so I got to sit down and explain to him why we, why we're doing this and, you know, ex and answer all of his questions. And now he's going to go and believe in that and sell it, you know, and, and believe in what he's doing and make our patients have a better experience because there's nothing worse than a patient coming in and somebody saying the the person taking care of them saying i don't know why we're doing this my manager made me do this and we shouldn't be that makes for a very terrible patient experience so little things like that really um make me feel happy at the end of the day like those are the things that matter awesome thanks so much uh, uh dr robar for me, it's, it's like, it's not a particular modality. It's like the paradigm of innovation. So we're, we're clinical physicists. We might be on the treatment wing and we notice something, right? We're trained as physicists. So we notice a problem. Something doesn't work well, or, or there's a room for improvement. And we turn that limitation into an opportunity. And then I get to, you know, ideate around that and work with my grad students and develop a solution and that fuels their research. And then maybe we commercialize something and, and make that available, not only to that one patient who we saw on the treatment floor, who had the problem, or there was a technological gap somehow, uh, but by following this process, we provide solutions to um, patients everywhere, right? And it's, it's really possible, you can do this. You can set up um, a career and a, 
a network and a way of working that you can you can actually do that. And for me, that's been the most rewarding kind of part of my career so far. Thank you, uh, Dr. Amataya. Yeah, uh, from my uh, work, I do not have a lot of patient interactions. Uh, uh, because we do a lot of our machine support and QA support and commissioning and things like that. So that doesn't involve a lot of patient interaction, but I'm very interested in the combination of modalities and how you can use PET CT uh, with the uh, uh, Linux now to be able to like uh, guide and uh, uh, the cancer treatment. So that's something that I'm uh, really interested in is to see how it works in the future. Now I know there are also ways to use MRI Linux and uh, there's few of them in Canada now. So I'm excited to see how uh, this uh, imaging techniques can be combined with uh, uh, Linux to actually improve uh, uh, the treatment delivery and uh, for example, improve our tracking. So I'm very excited about that and see how PET-CT could be used uh, for biology guided radiotherapy. That's the new term uh, that I've been hearing much about lately. So I'm interested to see how that works out. Uh, uh, in the near future. Dr. Burton. Yeah, I kind of agree with uh, Dr. Robar, but um, so everything you said, but in, instead I'll say artificial intelligence, uh, the deep learning uh, imaging, I'm super fascinated by that. Um, I love playing around with the images and also doing, uh, making calculations on like the modulated transfer function or the noise power spectrum to see how, it, how the uh, contrast and the noise uh, levels either improve or, or decrease. Um, and uh, so that's something that I'm fascinated with. So it's not just one modality this, you know, I've seen subtle PET, subtle MR, uh, DLIR on CT, for example. So that's what I'm excited about currently. Okay, great. Thank you. Those are all great answers and lots of exciting things happening in the field. Uh, so unfortunately, I think we have to wrap up the session now. Uh, thank you so much to our speakers and panelists for joining us today. I loved hearing uh, your perspectives on your own career paths and what the diversity of career paths that are available in medical physics. Um, and thank you as well to our audience for taking the time to be here. Uh, I know we didn't get to all of the questions that were asked in the chat, so if you'd like to just message us, we can forward, we're happy to forward your uh, questions to any of the speakers. Uh, our next session will be on March 4th, where we'll be discussing equity, diversity, and inclusion. And thank you, everyone. Have a good day and weekend. Good weekend.